Hi guys and welcome back. So you should have finished watching the video on R Studio and some basic commands. Ending with this slide, and let's move on to object types. Oops, let's click here and then move on to object types. All right, so what is an object? Well, we were looking in the last video in the environment window at the different variables and things that were available. So we had cheese, which was set to delicious, right? And so what are my potential options here for an object? I can think of objects as things that are usable in my current environment. Now remember that environment just means your current open working um, console, right? So when you close consoles, things tend to disappear. But if you have it open and you're working with it, what can I work with? We're going to call those objects. Now, some basic object types in R, we're going to go through each one kind of one at a time is a vector, a list, a matrix, a data frame, or if you're familiar with tidyverse, sometimes called a tibble. And those are like gonna be the big four types of objects that we're gonna work with. Now there are other ones, but they often mimic these four types. So let's say, for example, I run an analysis and I save the output. The output becomes an object. And it might have a special object name, like linear model output. But at its heart, it's mostly a list. So as long as you can kind of capture these four types of objects, you can usually understand what most other things present are. Now within those objects, we can have what are called values. And values can be other objects, but let's say we get down into what's stored in an object. Okay, and that can be characters, so text. Factors, which are a special type of character. A number, integer, or complex value, which is mostly just numbers. A logical or Boolean, which is true, false. And NAN or NA. So NAN is not a number. This is like what I tried to divide by zero. Okay, NA might be missing. And all of those can be stored in different forms within our different objects. And the different object types, these up here, vectors, lists, matrices, have different rules about how they can store these values. So that's why it's important to understand both. And then as an added wrinkle, objects can also have names. So the nice thing about um, the naming system is it allows us to work with those objects a little easier. So for this example, I'm going to use the Palmer Penguins library. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about libraries and packages in the next video. So take more for it right now. But um, that contains a data set called Penguins. And that Penguins data set is technically a data frame. And it has attributes or names. And so I just want to show you here that things can have names. And so it has names like species, island, flipper length. It's just more fun to talk about penguins than it is the famous flower data set. It also has row names and classes. So technically, this data set is considered a tibble, which is just a fancy data frame. Don't know what any of that means yet? That's OK. And so we can use this code here. So let's like learn a little bit of code along the way, this str function. Okay, so str stands for structure. Tell me what the structure of this object looks like. That is so handy because what it does is it tells you a lot about what the object is, which then tells you what you can do with it. So the structure of the penguins data set is that it's a tibble that is 344 by 8. So that's rows by columns. And that tibble is a, technically a complex data frame. It's got a couple of different columns here or different names, species, island, body mass, sex, year. And so the way I can think about this kind of format here is that this is essentially a data set. If you're ever used to looking at anything in Excel, this would be like having rows and columns in Excel. Now, we can also use the names function. So we've seen attributes here. Tell me the attributes of the data set. Tell me the structure of the data set or any object, it doesn't have to be a data set. Um, 
And then last, the names in the data set. I use the names function a lot because that helps me figure out how to get just a specific piece. So I can grab all of penguins, give me all the penguins because penguins are fun, right? Or only give me the body mass of the penguins. But if you can't remember how something is spelled, which is a common issue in my head, uh, I can say, give me the name so I can remember how this is written. Is it body mass with underscores? Or is it body mass with dots? Which one is it? So let's look at like what the object types. Now we've seen kind of an example. Vectors are the simplest object types. And you can think about vectors as kind of like one row or one column of data. And vectors can be one item long. So when I say that they're the simplest of object types, what I mean is that it could literally just be the word delicious from our last video, right? Or it could be just the number four. However, it could be a whole set of numbers, four, five, six, or um, other descriptive adjectives about cheese. Wonderful, fantastic. Okay. So you can kind of think about it as like one row or one column. Okay. Now the tricky part with vectors is that all of the objects have to be of the same class or type. Okay. And so if you put in a character right, or a number, they all have to be characters or they all have to be numbers. You can't mix and match. And so one of the most common error messages that you'll see when you first get started is something about coercion. <laughs> sounds, sounds like you're like forcing your computer to tell the truth, right? And coercion here means that I am converting between object types and it doesn't always like that. So I can convert a four to a character because four technically is a character. It's just a special type of character. It's, it happens to be a number. I cannot, however, convert the letter C into a number. And so when, you're, when you have this rule that all the objects must be of the same class or type, um, sometimes you can convert between them and sometimes not. Okay. And so if you put in a whole thing of numbers, it wants them all to be numbers. If you put in a bunch of letters, it wants them all to be letters. One object uh, class that we didn't really talk about was dates, because dates, to me, <laughs> dates, bane of my existence <laughs> in R, they're really hard to work with. But if you put in one type of date and you try to mix it with another type of date, it will like be very unhappy with you, <laughs> okay? So they all have to be the same type. So if you try to mix and match it, we'll try to coerce them. And if it can't coerce them, it'll give you an NA. So you might see this message, NA is introduced by coercion. That just means that you had some data stored in that column that you can't convert. And so it just made them missing because it can't convert them. So from our lecture last time, we stored a variable uh, x as four. Remember here that this means that there's code happening. And if I told it to print out x again, it would tell me that the variable was four. Okay. The little one here indicates what place that is in. The first word here is in, or the first not word, um, object here is in. Um, R is a one index language, which means that it starts counting at the number one, which if you are familiar with coding, like, duh, why wouldn't we, where, where else would we start counting, right? One, two, three, four. Uh, many other languages are a zero index language where the first item is the zeroth item. Okay. If you're European, you're like, duh, <laughs> of course, like the elevator, right? Starts on the zeroth floor, you move up one level, you're on the first floor, you move up one level, you're on the second floor. And so you just, if you're going to code multiple languages, this is just something important to know that R is a one index language, meaning the first item is, the first item is the oneth item. And so the one here indicates the number of the first item for each printed row. So to show you how that gets um, translated when you have a bunch of items, let's look at the species. We'll talk more about this dollar sign thing. Um, penguin species list okay, and see how it starts with one here and then eight. So that means that this is the first item, this here is the eighth item. And so it's just giving you a hint um, how, uh, what item it is. So if I wanted the first time that Gen 2 here applies, I would just have to count 148, 9, 10, 11, uh, 50, <laughs> 
51, 52. Did I do that right? I don't, I think I miscounted. 148, 149, 150, 151, 152, 153 is the first time that this appears. This is 154 and now magically, cause I can count, this is 155. Okay. And just let's look at some examples how to make vectors. So we're gonna set A here to one colon 20. Make this a little bigger. The colon operator here just means count up by ones basically. So when I did one colon 20, it actually gave me a list of 20 different values. Uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say list. It gave me a vector of 20 different values um, counting up by ones. So it's a quick way to do some counting. That's A here. We've got B, which we've decided to make a sequence. Case the sequence function here in green. So you can tell it's a function because it came up in this green text in my color scheme here. And inside the parentheses, we're going to talk about this a whole lot at the end of the lecture, but inside the parentheses here, we've got what are called arguments. So functions start with the function name and it'll change a special color if it recognizes it. Then they'll have parentheses. And within that function, you tell it what arguments you want. And arguments are just what are the rules that I'm going to apply for that function. So the sequence function has three different arguments that we're currently looking at. There might be more. You can use that question mark to look at the um, help guide, right? And so sequence is from, so where to start, to where to end, and then by. So I did the exact same thing as the colon where I said start from one, count up to 20, by ones, okay. but I could do by uh, point one, and then I'd have a big, a much longer vector. It still created me a single vector, one row of twenty objects. Okay. Now, everybody's favorite function is the C function. It stands for combine or concatenate, okay. and just combines these three uh, text values together. And so this is gonna be a character here where we have three different words, three different characters. Cheese is great, because it is. And the one more, the repeat function or rep, it's got two arguments, um, the thing you wanna repeat. So I'm gonna repeat one and then how many times? 30 times. All of these are things we'll use this semester. Um, and the main thing to get from this is that we've made four different vectors of different lengths and they're all the same type. They're all either numeric or um, characters. And we're starting to learn a couple of uh, basic functions. So sequence, C, you will use C a lot anytime you need to combine things together in a vector format and repeat. Now on those variables, I'm gonna look at what class they are, what type they are. So a here, which was a count up from one to 20 is an integer. And that makes sense. Uh, you might expect it to say number, but it only types out numeric if you've got decimals. So integers meaning kind of whole numbers. The class for C as character, that was our cheese is great example. The class for penguins here is a tibble or a data frame. And then I can also do classes of specific sections. So penguins has a column called species and that specific column is a factor. And factors are just special types of character vectors that can only be certain objects. So for example, if I wanna say, what is your favorite color? Right? But I only wanna give you four options. Let's take a multiple choice test, right? Is it orange? Is it purple? Is it blue or is it green? Okay. And you might think that I might pick purple given my appearance. However, my favorite color is actually orange. <laughs> so, um, but I own a lot of maroon as well, having gone to, you know, work, worked at and gone to a school with maroon colors. So let's go orange, maroon, purple, all right, and blue. I like blue too. And so factor variables force me to pick between those four. Okay, I can't have other objects. So you can think of factors as sort of your multiple choice options. Now the functions themselves change based on the object type. So I haven't lost, we haven't forgotten about object types. We've only covered vector here, but I wanna show you that it, like the, the relationship between object types and, 
and functions is not one to one. And that's going to seem kind of confusing until we talk about the summary function, which is you're going to be your new best friend. And so the functions are these commands that we're running like class that we just ran, repeat, right? The C function. And I'll also try throughout the semester when I'm talking about specific code to put it in a special font. And the code inside these parentheses are called the arguments. And the output and the arg like depends based on the type of variable we put in. So the dem function here grabs the dimensions of anything that's not one row of data. Well, I think you can actually put it in with one row of data. It would just say one by you know, something else. Um, but the dimensions here for penguins, since this is rows and columns, is 344 by eight. Okay. Uh, a thing to learn very early on is that when you have multiple dimensions, you know, it's not just one vector, um, rows go first and then columns. Okay. And that's true. We'll talk about that in the subsetting section, which is next. And so we've got 344 rows by eight columns. However, if I put in length, and it already shows you the answer here, but I love asking students this, like what is the length of a data set? And many people suggest that it probably should be rows. Like there's 344 rows because we're data people. We're interested in how many uh, data points we have. Okay. But length on a data frame gives you the number of columns, okay? Because it counts the number of names that it has for each column. And that like forever just like <laughs> blew my mind. <laughs> so length then can change. If I say, okay, fine, give me the length of this specific column. Now I got 344 back like I expected, okay? So the function will vary based on what kind of object you put into it. So they have different rules for different types of objects. Now the summary function is one of the most versatile functions in R because it can take so many different types of objects and spits out different things depending on what it got put in, which is cool. So we've talked about vectors, let's move on to lists. Okay, lists are kind of an interesting but also kind of frustrating <laughs> object type in R. So vectors allow us this sort of one row of data, but let's say we want to have multiple rows or multiple types. And it's that multiple types that's going to get us. Okay. With a vector, it's key to understand they have to all be numeric, character, factor, whatever. You cannot mix and match. Lists are combinations, they're exactly the same, like a checklist, like a to-do list, if you will. So it's a list of different objects. They can be a list of vectors, they can be a list of data frames, they can be a list of, um, what's the other one, matrices. <laughs> like, so lists can be lists of lists, actually, and that's where they get particularly tricky. But lists are just any grouping of variables that can be multiple types between lists items. And then here's a big thing. This is in italics for a reason. They could also be different lengths. Okay, we haven't gotten to this problem yet, but that's in the next object type. Okay. So lists can be multiple types and different lengths. Okay, and that's their key feature is that they are, are not really limited to only being numeric or only being four items long. And the output from many functions is saved as a list for this reason. And by this, I mean many statistical analyses functions, like complex things. So I teach a course on structural equation modeling, which is like, you know, statistics on steroids. And the output that you get from that is very long, so long. And so it saves this as this like sort of giant nested list where I could say, give me only part one of the output or only part four of the output. And so we'll run into lists a lot as the, the structured um, analysis output. And lists usually have names so that you can grab only part of the output. And we'll talk about subsetting or indexing. So grabbing only part in the next video. But to show you that just kind of in action here, I've run a very simple um, linear regression and you can see here, so we've saved our linear regression. We're predicting their flipper length with their bill length. And you don't have to understand any of this code just yet. Here's the main piece I do want you to get, which is the structure of the output. 
and that's a list. Okay. It's got coefficients, right? And so it has coefficients, <coughs> excuse me, is the name of that section. And then within that, it also has more names. Okay. It's got a list of residuals. Okay. Notice how they're different links. One moment. First one is only two objects long. The second one is 342 objects long. Okay, it's got a list of effects, fitted values, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Okay. And so they're different types. Some of them are characters. Some of them are numbers. And so that's the beauty of lists, is the length of each piece doesn't have to be the same, and it doesn't have to be the same type. So I can mix integers, numbers, and uh, factors and characters all together. And then just to show you the output here, I grabbed just the coefficients. This is a named number. And so it's got the names here and then the numbers. If you're interested in knowing how bill length and flipper length are connected here. <laughs> Excuse me. So that's all kind of one dimensional data in a sense. Let's look at dimensional data now. Okay. So we have matrices. So matrices are vectors with dimensions, like a two by three has two rows and three columns. Okay. However, matrices main limitation personally is that they all have to be of the same data type. So every single value stored in the matrix has to be something, a number, a character, whatever. Okay. And then data frames and tibbles. Now I'm gonna combine these together because they practically are the same type of data, except that tibbles can have these extra components added to them. Tibbles are sort of uh, tidy versus version of data frames. I'm mostly going to talk and work with base R and um, work with data frames, but it's important to know what tibbles are because there'll be a couple of, of examples that I'll give you that um, tibbles are the problem. <laughs> so well, you can help troubleshoot some common error messages. So a tibble is a fancy data frame. It's just the way I think about it. Um, that has like extra names, okay, extra pieces add on to a data frame. But at heart, it's a data frame. And these are like matrices, but the columns can be different types. So now we've hit the reason why we have four. Okay. Vectors, all the same type, one row of data. Lists, different links, different data types, put it together. Okay. Matrices, forced structure, all the same type. Data frames for structure can be different types. So we've kind of covered all of our bases now. Lists, no for structure, different types. Matrices, for structure, types, all the same type, sorry. <laughs> data frames, for structure, different types. So I can have one column of data that's this penguin species name and one column of data that's the length and those are a factor and a number. So let's make our own little matrix. Okay. And especially to talk about these square brackets. Okay. And these square brackets are gonna be your friend. We're gonna use them a lot in the next lecture. Okay. And so the square brackets represent rows and columns. And this allows us to subset or grab specific values. Okay. So let's just make the matrix first and then come back to this idea. Okay. So when you make a matrix, you just say, hey, matrix. Hey, okay. tell it what data you want, how many rows there are, and how many columns there are. And so there are other arguments to matrix. So you can tell it to fill by row or fill by column. Many of these arguments have defaults. So when you don't tell it what to do, it fills by column. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, by column. So down instead of across. Okay. And so this is a five by two, okay, because remember it's rows by columns. So five rows by two columns. And let's say I want the number eight here. Okay, so to get the number eight, I have to come down to the third row. So see how this is three comma and then nothing. Okay, when there's nothing there, it gives you the whole row. So if I typed ma my matrix square bracket, three comma nothing, I would get three and eight. Okay. And so the code here is telling you how to get that number back, okay, or that row of data back. If I wanted the whole second column, I would type my matrix, square bracket, comma, two, square bracket. And I would get this whole column back. 
But if I very specifically want the number eight, I would do three comma two, okay? Because it's in the third row and the second column. Okay. And so this square bracket thing, it's kind of like, um, you can either think about this as like a video game or like a, um, one of those storage places, <laughs> right? So you have to go down to the specific storage row and then down to your specific storage locker. So it's on the third row in the second column. Now data frames work the same way when it comes to the rows and columns with the square brackets. Okay. Um, but the nice thing about data frames is they can allow us to do something that's like not all numbers or not all um, characters. So we can mix and match between text and numbers. And they also have attributes, which so do lists. Okay. So here I told it to print penguins. This is row one, got excited, row one, columns two and three. Okay, so here's row one. Okay. Column two is what island this penguin lived on and, excuse me, the bill length. Okay. Now it's told me what kind of variable this is as well. Okay, so this is a factor and this is considered a double or numeric. Now, um, that is part of the attributes thing. Okay, so I grabbed row one, columns two and three. Now here I did something a little different and there's no comma. Okay. So I just said four through 25. Remember the colon counts up. So four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, that kind of thing. But I'm not telling it to grab penguins anymore. So penguins is a data frame that has rows and columns. Penguins dollar sign sex, a dollar sign, what does that thing do? Well, the dollar sign grabs the list of, of names that are possible and prints them out. So let's flip over here to make this like very clear and look at that penguins data set. So I'm gonna tell that penguins data set to load, which I've already done in my lecture, but the lecture is static now and it's not part of this. So we've got a penguins here now in our console. Now let's just look at that penguins data set. Okay. So the view function is one of the trickiest bastards. Okay. <laughs> so it what it does is it uh, in our studio, okay, allows us to look at this kind of like we'd use Excel. So I really love view, but it's one of the only base R functions <laughs> that is capitalized. Okay, it's capital V view. And that just makes me totally bonkers because most of them are lowercase. Cool. And then the difference between an uppercase and a lowercase V is like not visually that clear. So almost always, if you get an error message that says, let me purposely type it wrong here. What? What? You guys. Did they? Somebody added lowercase view. Okay. Well, never mind. Never mind what I said. Forever in a hundred years. I don't know when that happened. Let's find out. I'm going to have to look that up. Oh, view an object and pat. Maybe it's because I have something open that'll run view. Oh, hold on. Okay, now I want to know. Sorry, we're gonna get slightly off on a tangent here. Okay, library, I've got to reopen my, no, I don't have to reopen my penguins. Ah, okay. <laughs> I was like, when did this happen? Okay, so in base R, meaning we haven't really talked a whole lot about packages yet. We'll get to that in the next one. Um, base R, like what happens when you open R Studio and what's open? which is called base R, has a function called view. Okay. It's one of the only functions that is capitalized V view. And the difference between, you know, big V view and little V view is very hard to see when you're typing sometimes. And so if you ever get this error message, error in view, could not find function view, don't email me and tell me there's no view function. <laughs> that usually means that you've spelled it wrong. Okay, like I can't tell you the number of times I've typed length uh length like this right that won't work 
a good sign is if it doesn't change colors. Okay, or in um, in like a script, regular length will change color sometimes. Okay, not today. Um, that might just be in Markdown. Okay, or if it doesn't have tab as an option. Okay, so re in regular length here, if I hit tab, I can see the function name here, or inside the parentheses, I can see its arguments. So if you hit tab and you don't see anything, <laughs> I hit tab and it made it regular view. Okay. So view is one of the weird ones. Unless of course you have apparently a different package open that has the lowercase version and then you're like, oh, it's magic. They fixed it. They haven't fixed it. So view is capital V, but that tangent and side road aside, let's look at penguins here. So penguins, our view function, we can see it kind of like Excel. We can sort the data frame, okay, that kind of thing. And penguins has a column called six. So one thing that um, we can use is the dollar sign. And well, the dollar sign here, uh, forever in a hundred years, I taught this as data set dollar sign column name, data set dollar sign column name. You'll see, still hear me say that, but really it's, it's object dollar sign names. And so any object that has names, when you put in the dollar sign, will pop up what those names are. And that is something that you can specifically grab, only that. So I don't have to look at the whole Penguins data set, I can grab just the gender column. And that is a factor with two levels, male and female. So that's what that dollar sign does. But by pulling out the dollar sign, look how it printed. And that looks a lot like a vector because it is. So remember, we can always use um, no, not class type. I'm I'm mixing and matching Python and R type class. I think if we use class, we can tell it's a vector because it says that it's a factor. Okay, so anything that's a vector, it will tell you what kind of object is in it. Okay, there's no like vector class per se, right? But if I did class on the penguins data set, that's where it tells me it's a data frame. Okay. All right, back to the slides, wherever they went. I think I closed them. Whoops, <laughs> let's reopen them. <laughs> I don't know where the slides went. Did I just like close them, close them? I don't know what I did. Here they are again, apologies. V view and we'll close the slides. We were here. Okay. So nope, not there. We were here. Okay. So why no comma? That was a long way around to why no comma, but here we are. So the dollar sign created this into a vector. Now that it's a vector, it only has one dimension. So there's no comma because there's no rows or columns anymore. It's just just you know one set of numbers. And so I printed out here the fourth through the 25th one. All right, what if I wanna combine data sets, right? So we've talked about the concatenate function or C for vectors, but dimensional data has spe uh, some specific other functions that help you combine. So R bind will bind things together that are rows C bind allows you to bind things together that are columns. Okay, and there are a bunch of other variations on a theme here, but these are the basic ones in base R, meaning no special packages required. So um, C bind here, I've combined X and Y. So I made X one through five and Y six through 10. Since they're the same size, meaning they're both five objects, I can combine them together as columns or I can combine them together as rows. If you try to combine two objects together that aren't the same size, um, it will get mad at you and it'll tell you that they're different links. And, you know, well, one thing we have to do, okay, is remind R where things are, okay? And that's not meant to be a goofy saying, it's meant to really capture on the fact that objects are only callable by the name that is currently present. Okay. So I know I have penguins open, right? We've seen that we have this penguins data set open. 
and you can see visually that it has this little cute drop down window and I can see that sex exists in this penguin data set. But if I just try to type sex, it tells me that's not found. I, damn it, I can see it. it's right here, right? <laughs> like it's there, I see it, you see it, <laughs> you know? Um, you have to tell R where it is. So one of the functions that I was talking about on the slides, LS, LS is this really great function that shows you everything in the environment window. And so, you know, the longer that you do this, the less you look at this window, um, if you want personal experience. Uh, and LS just reminds me what all I have. So it's a kind of a list of everything in the environment. And I have to remember that penguins is structured. So if I do LS on the penguin data set, it reminds me of the name. So now we've seen four different ways to do this, right? So there's attributes, there's STR for structure, LS for list of everything kind of available and names. So back to something I think I said in the last lecture, the question in R isn't, can it do it? It's how many different ways? And so you just have to remind R. So you have to remember that it's called penguins and then use the dollar sign or some other subsetting function to grab sex. And so this is one of the things I see students do, uh, uh, learners do at the beginning when you're working with it. Because we have this great integrated development environment, you can see that flipper length is there. Why won't it work, right? I'm typing flipper length. And a good hint is if you hit tab and nothing happens, it doesn't remember that it's there. Like I can see it, it's right there. Okay. That's because it's nested within penguins. So you have to say, go to penguins, then grab flipper links. Okay. Pretend like R is dumb and it doesn't remember where you hid something. Okay. This is like your significant other when they've set the keys down somewhere. Like, do you remember where the keys? And I'm just like, no, because I'm not you, <laughs> right? So you have to go, where was the last place you saw them? Okay, let's start working there. So you got to tell R, this is the last place it, hit, it was at, it was in penguins, and then look for flipper length. Okay. okay, one more slide here is converting between object types. So just because it's one type doesn't mean I can't convert it into others, but I can also make it mad when I do this. Okay. And so there's a whole host of functions called as dot. Okay, so if we start typing that, not doing penguins here, as dot, we'll see that there's a bunch of different ones, as.call, as.character, as.dataframe, as.date. Like, it list goes on and on and on, okay? Big old list. And um, that's what this point is, a reminder to show you guys what's available. Uh, most of the ones we're gonna use are as.dataframe, as numeric, as factor. So we're gonna just kind of switch between types and value types. So between the object types, so data frames versus matrices versus lists, and the uh, value types, numeric versus character versus factor. But you do have to be careful. So I made myself a data frame. So we remember we had X and Y, which is one through five, and then six through 10. I combined them together by column, and I just made it into a data frame. As proof, show me the structure. It says it's a data frame with five observations of two variables. Remember data frames, rows by columns. So it's five rows by two columns. Okay. Now let's say I wanna convert um, this character vector here. So these are all characters. You know they're characters because they got the quotes. You have to put characters, quotes around our characters. If you type a word without the quotes, it thinks that it's a variable name. So we've got one, two, three, but three here is a character version of a number. I'm gonna convert that into a number. But you have to be careful because one as text format is a character. When you try to convert that into a number, it goes, yeah, I don't, I don't know what you're doing. So it's NA, NA, and then three. And the NAs here stand for missing, not applicable, not available, whatever version you wanna think of. All right, so that wraps up our section on object types where we're switching, but thinking about what's stored in our environment window. The next section we're gonna cover is just kind of a smattering of other ideas about subsetting. How do I get only specific amounts of data that I'm interested in? 
uh, what are all these package things that you keep mentioning? Like what the heck is the library? Um, a little bit more on functions and then everybody's least favorite thing, which is working directories. Okay, so head on over to video number three to complete this week's set of lectures.